Thank you so much, Nasu. Um, I'm kind of a loud speaker, so I don't know that I necessarily need this, but uh, so just uh, let me know if I'm getting any feedback. So um, I'm really excited to talk to you guys all today about autism spectrum disorders, a topic that's really near and dear to my heart, um, both because we see kids from all over the state with um, both for diagnosis and early management, and then we do a lot of crisis management of individuals with autism spectrum disorders. And so my hope today is to try to actually hit a little bit of both of these things, thinking about from um, a primary care perspective, what it means to initially diagnose and manage and refer on for evaluations, but also a lot of the questions that we get um, as a uh, child psychiatry subspecialist is what to do with aggression or irritability that comes up with autism. That's a really common um, concern that comes to us. So I'm gonna try to hit on that as well today. So I don't have any disclosures. Um, and so, like I said, I'll talk a little bit about screening tools, how to refer so that your patients can't get services, and then talk a little bit about early management and interventions. Um, so one of the biggest uh, points that I usually want to hit home with primary care physicians is that we can reliably make a diagnosis of autism down to the age of 12 months. So we see kids anywhere, so 12 months is kind of our cutoff that we have sometimes seen children younger than that. Um, and then uh, our diagnostic clinic will see individuals up until the age of 18, though we do have a number of individuals that we treat within our clinic who are in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. Um, and so these um, individuals, both as children and adults, have longstanding needs uh, that we help provide for them. But the piece I think that is the most concerning for me, and I'm sure you guys have heard, that the CDC just came out with new data again, talking about um, an increase in prevalence again of autism spectrum disorders. So it continues to rise. That's something that's been tracked nationally. Um, and now the data um, is that it's... Um, even more common that we re than we realize. And, and actually, one of the really interesting things that came out of the new CDC report is that for the first time, a statement that they made really clearly is that they actually anticipate it continuing to rise. Okay, and so that's uh, actually due for a number of different reasons, uh, which I won't necessarily cover today, but if anyone wants to know more about that, I'm happy to talk about that. And then, you know, and the second issue that comes up for us is that parents often report concerns prior to the 18-month time period. So I know that that's the time period in which primary care providers are initially recommended to screen, but most commonly parents, when we talk to parents about early initial concerns, they're typically talking to us about symptoms that they're seeing at six to nine months of age. Though the, in the data, in, um, the studies suggest to us that most parents report things in the 15 to 18 month age range, but again, the CDC is reporting that the average age of diagnosis is coming out to the age of four. Um, and that actually has to do with a number of different reasons. Um, and some of it is, continues to be, and this is something that we continue to hear from parents, um, is what's going on with screening and early management with their um, primary care providers. So, uh, we see a wide range of practice around screening and management, and I know that there have been differing things based on what the AAP recommends, what the USPTF recommends, um, in terms of screening and management of autism spectrum disorders. But part of the other issue is that um, there's a lack of familiarity with how to screen and how to refer. So my hope is to address some of those things today. The biggest reason that I feel very strongly about earlier screening and earlier management and earlier diagnosis is that prognosis, when I meet a family for the first time, so I saw an 18 month old and a 16 year old in clinic yesterday giving the diagnosis for the first time, right? So um, big, big differences in, in ages. And so really what we're looking at is thinking, when I see a child for the first time, not only am I thinking about how I assess them today, but you really what the parents come in and the, the piece that really brings the most tears and difficulty in conversation is what, what does this mean for my child? What are they gonna look like in the long term? Are they gonna function like everybody else? Those, that's the big question that parents wanna know. And so you know, what, what I'm telling them is when I look at your kid, I'm thinking about their prognosis as being related to four main factors. Okay, some of those things are outside of our control. 
okay? Whether or not your child has comorbid cognitive impairment, or the other terms are intellectual disability, or what we used to call back in the day mental retardation. Okay, so that is a big one. Um, and that's something that we also assess in clinic. And then whether or not they have other psychiatric or medical comorbidities. So in the past, we used to think about their medical comorbidities like seizure disorders being really common. What we know from the new CDC data as they identify more and more kids who don't have cognitive impairment is that the rates of seizure disorders are actually what looks like are decreasing, but they're actually having a wider catchment of a broader range of kids. So the more severely impaired kids who have more significant either genetic disorders or medical disorders are fewer. Um, the rates of kids who have a broad range of psychiatric comorbidities are actually greater, right? So these higher functioning kids who know that they don't quite fit in and want friends but don't totally understand it and struggle with bullying and depression and anxiety and ADHD. And all of those things confer their own individual risk. And then the last thing, and this is the piece that I think that is the most difficult, which is language development by the age of five. So early childhood language development does impact outcome. And this is where early intervention, early identification and intervention is really where we're looking to make the majority of the difference. So how, how do you screen a child in your office? And there's a, 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 when we think about screening, we actually have to step back for a second and think about, well, what do kids actually look like when they present at your office at 12 months or 18 months or 24 months? Um, and so like I said, even though sim we know that symptoms present prior to 12 months, part of the problem is those symptoms pre present not as how you would expect. And I think that's a big um, issue with the mismatch that occurs with understanding what to think about and ask about when a kid presents in your clinic. And so this study that was actually published in the Journal of Pediatrics in 2015 is a really nice one, um, looking at very young kids. So these are the kids at the 18 month, 24 month, 30 month appointments. And um, what they did is they did very, so they took people like me who do autism diagnosis like all the time and had them do brief 20 minute evaluations of a group of kids, some of whom had autism and some of whom did not. Um, and what they found is that even those people who do expert autism evaluations missed almost 40% of the cases, okay? So it's very subtle, much more subtle, I think, than people re uh, recognize. And the other really interesting piece is that almost 90% of the kids' behavior that was coded was typical, okay? So the amount of atypicality is really minimal. So the idea that you're gonna catch it in an office visit is not something that's just gonna come up in and of itself. And as you and as providers, as you guys as providers all know, um, parent reliability in terms of report is really variable, right? So you're trying to kind of match those two things together with a child who has almost 90% typical behavior, right? So how do we reconcile those things? And so I'll echo some of what Dr. LaPlatte said, which is, to me, probably one of the most consistent ways to do that is to use an identified screening tool. But then I'm also gonna give you some clinical pearls of how to think about some of the items, um, because the screening tools themselves are not perfect either, right? So you have to understand a little bit about the phenomenology and the presentation in very young children in order to understand um, the screening tools. So the one that I feel like everybody is always familiar with is the MCHAT. Okay, and the MCHAT is wonderful. Um, part of the problem with the MCHAT is it doesn't really look at the very young kids and it doesn't look at kids who are really preschool age and beyond. And so, um, and so that's part of my issue with the MCHAT. Um, I'll also cover the social communication questionnaire and I, I really like the social communication questionnaire and I'll give you a little bit more detail about it. I do see a lot of people using the CARS, the GARS, and the ASSQ. These are um, scales that I've seen both primary care providers use as well as school systems utilize. The problem with both of these, um, all three of these, as well as any other rating scale essentially other than the MCHAT and the SEQ, is that the sensitivity and specificity of them are very low. So really if you're gonna use one, um, one in young kids, it really should be the MCHAT. If you're gonna really use a rating scale in older kids, it really should be the SEQ, the social communication questionnaire. Um, so I know everybody knows about the MCHAT, but I do want to mention the MCHAT briefly because 
understanding the items is helpful, helpful in thinking about phenomenology. So the first, again, is that it only covers kids 16 to 30 months of age. Okay, so it's not gonna cover the younger kids or the older kids. Um, the nice thing about it is that it's only 20 items and it's parent rated, um, and the sensitivity of it is, I think, good, not, not fantastic. The specificity of it, obviously, is very, very high. So if a child scores on the MCHAT, um, the likelihood that they do have autism or they're gonna screen in for autism is high. Um, the problem is that it's not gonna catch everybody, right? So the sensitivity is not 0.99. Okay, so there are gonna be kids who are going to be missed. And part of it is because the questions themselves, I think a lot of times parents don't understand. And so my, if you are using the MCHAT, I have some specific tips on how I would like people to use it. Okay, now I know this is difficult in real practice. Okay, so what I, when I've um, given this presentation at various institutions throughout the state, usually I try to talk with people afterwards and I would love to do that here to hear about some of the, um, some of the ways in which you've been able to implement it or some of the ways in which it's been challenging because um, I feel like there's a lot we can do in sharing with each other some of these tips. So some things that I've seen other places do well is they have the nurses um, give the MCHAT out in advance prior to the appointment so that the parents can fill it out and you have a chance to look at it before the appointment. And I think that's a really great way. I think if there's any other questions that arise about the MCHAT or if you don't get a chance to actually review it, my second suggestion would be to bring them back in prior to their next well child visit. Okay, so that's one thing that I see happen with a lot of providers is they'll come in for their 18 month visit, parents bring up concerns, maybe the MCHAT isn't positive, and then they'll say, okay, we'll wait till 24 months. So to me, that is, you know, as you guys all know, six months in, a li in the life of a really little one is a really long time. So my suggestion is to bring them back for a non-well child visit to readdress the concerns, the developmental concerns, where you have a chance where you're not trying to do all of the other wonderful things that people do in their um, visits. You guys are trying to cover so many things at once um, that I think trying to separate out and dedicate a visit to it is really nice if you're able to do that. And I also think feedback that I hear from families is that that is something that they're looking for. They're really waiting till that next appointment to come back and talk to you guys about it. Um, so I really think they would appreciate the ability to come back and talk with you earlier. Um, now here's the MCHAT, you guys are all familiar with it. You know what I think is really interesting? Because I think everybody has, see, uh, like all of my pediatric and family medicine colleagues have seen the MCHAT. And what I notice is that everybody always knows the first item. They always know the first item. The first item is if you point at something, does your child look at it? I feel like that's the one that I always hear about. Um, and the reason I find that really interesting is because pointing is a very interesting developmental milestone in very young children. Okay, so kids will use pointing, I mean they need a number of different skills to use pointing, but once they get language, they no, lo they no longer need pointing. So once they, so if you have a child who can't say chandelier, right, then they're gonna point. But once they can say light, right? I know, yeah, chandelier is a conflict. Well, let's, let's use the word lamp, right? Once they, can, once they can say lamp, they don't need to point anymore, right? So that's when you actually see the use of pointing actually drops, and that's developmentally normal, and we want them to use language and nonverbal skills and eye contact to direct attention and not pointing. Okay, so for an, a typically developing, cognitively intact kid, they're gonna have you know, a number of single words by 18 months may, for some of the advanced kids, especially for some of the higher functioning ASD kids, they may have 200 single words at 18 months. They may be putting two words together at 24 months. But what they're not doing is using nonverbals to direct attention but they may not be using pointing. So for us, once a kid can, has enough language, we don't care about pointing anymore, actually. And so it's really important to understand the other really important items on, uh, on the MCHAT 
um, other than just pointing. So um, the other important thing to know about the MCHAT is how you use the MCHAT. So according to the guidelines, and this is, this is the problem I have with the MCHAT, okay? So technically, the way the MCHAT is supposed to be used, and I'm, I'm actually gonna recommend something that's a little bit different from that. The way the MCHAT is supposed to be used is that if you have a score greater than three, so if a child scores on more than three items, then you're actually supposed to administer a follow-up. Okay, and that follow-up is actually like a 45-minute multi-step questionnaire, which nobody has time for. Okay, like who's, who's really gonna do that? Okay, so my recommendation actually is that you refer on at that point. Okay, if you're, if in real, realistically, if you are not gonna perform the follow-up to the MCHAT, then you're kind of moving down into the next category. Okay, and we, at least from my perspective, I would rather have more referrals um, and be able to say that that child doesn't have autism. This is just an expressive language disorder or a mixed language disorder or a pragmatic language disorder than to have that kid be missed because maybe they scored three but nothing was done after that point. So this additional score of anything above eight and immediately referring to diagnostic evaluations only occurs if you've administered this follow-up piece. And I'll, I'm gonna talk to you guys a little bit about some of the items that are done in the follow-up. So you have a couple of those tools with you um, when you're in uh, with patients. Um, so the social communication questionnaire, the reason, so it's a little bit longer rather than 20 items, it's 40 items, but the nice thing is you can use it from four into adulthood, okay? And so the downside of the social communication questionnaire is that it has a much lower sensitivity and specificity, and that's because these kids are generally way more comorbid. But the, but the nice thing about the social communication questionnaire is, it, is it's essentially asking a lot of the same questions that are on the MCHAT, but expanded. Um, and the, the, it also is very good at capturing those kids who are comorbid. So those kids who are really socially anxious and you're like, I don't know, are they just, they're just not good with other kids? They're like socially anxious or is it that they really struggle with making friends? The SEQ, Q is good at picking those up. For kids who are really, uh, have really significant ADHD, hyperactivity, impulsivity, you know, like they're pushing that kid in the classroom, they're struggling, you know, with their teacher, they're not fin finishing their homework, but you also wonder, I don't know, they're kind of like rigid and repetitive, do they maybe have autism? The SEQ has been studied in that population too. For kids with medical disorders, genetic disorders, specific syndrome, the SEQ has been studied and validated in all of those different populations. Okay, so if there is one instrument that can hit all of those different groups, it's the social communication questionnaire. And even though the cutoff for the social communication questionnaire is 15, in most of the other comorbid populations, the cutoff is 11. And so you only need 11 out of 40 items in order to screen for needing more evaluation. And this is what the social communication questionnaire looks like. Um, it's very similar to the other one, uh, to the MCHAT. Um, but you'll see here some of the first items, if you can read this small print, is um, it starts off with language, which is different than with the MCHAT. So here, you know, the first one is, can they speak in more than short phrases? Right, so that's, and that's why this is a good questionnaire for kids who have normal um, cognition because these kids are gonna have pretty otherwise grossly typical language development even though their language is atypical. Then the next one is the one we really think about the most in older kids. Can they have a to and fro conversation? Can they talk with you back and forth? That's the big thing we wonder. Um, and the older kids is the thing we test for when they come into clinic. So this questionnaire follows that, um, the, uh, the developmental milestones of what are specific for a single, for an older child. So screening in your office. Um, the big thing that I really want people to understand is what we consider really to be the hallmark of autism spectrum disorders, and that is the ability to have a back and forth social relationship with someone, social reciprocity. And the, um, the beginnings of social, recipro uh, social reciprocity really are grounded in whether or not a kid can understand what's going on in someone else's mind, okay? And so one way in which that displays itself is something called joint attention, which is you use eye contact to direct attention somewhere, to share an experience with someone. 
Okay, so that's this. So, you know, I look at this, it's interesting, I look at you, you think it's funny, and that's joint attention. Like, look at me looking at this, look at me looking at this, that's it. No words, nothing else. That is directing, that is joint attention. You're directing someone's attention with eye contact and nonverbals um, to something else. So, you know, so say somebody comes in and you're not exactly sure. So a good question to ask a parent is, when you look at something, you're not saying anything, just when you look at it. This verbiage is exactly from the follow-up to the MCHAT. What does your child do? Can you give me an example? And then you can model in your office, just like I did to you, like, I looked at that, I don't know, the picture of the ear with the ear infection in it. You know, um, see, this is what I would do to see if my kid notices what that looks like. Um, and so a kid who passes that item would look at that object or point to it or comment on it because they've noticed that you did. And a fail would be if they ignored it or didn't respond. So not responding to the nonverbal elements. The one that you guys, I think, are a lot more familiar with is, is response to name. But I'm encouraging you to ask a parent about that. This is one that parents of young children often tell me that they do see, that when you call your child's name, what do they do? How do they respond? And again, model it. And the key there is to tell the parent not to, you're not physically touching the child. So you wanna call the kid's name and see how they respond. Do they look at you? Do they turn to you? Do they vocalize a response? Or do they make kind of seem like they're responding, but not really? Or do they only respond if you're touching them? Does the parent have to call their name multiple times in order to respond? And then the one, so for those of you guys who have heard, some of you guys heard me speak before, is social smiling. Right? So this is, the big one is how you ask about it. Okay, so I want people to change the way they ask about social smiling. Okay, because all kids smile, all my autistic, my patients with autism, they smile a lot. They're like smiley, super cute kids, okay? What they don't always do is share a happy emotional state with someone. And that is done by what is the true definition of social smiling, which is when I smile at you, whether you smile back at me. Like when you recognize that my smile and that happiness transfers into you and you feel that happiness and you smile too. That's social smiling. Okay, so you want to model that in your office? Like you just, you stand next to your kid and you, well for you guys, they don't like you guys because you like poke them and stuff like that. So it's really hard. So you just have to like talk to a parent about how to do it, I think, and then, I don't know, get your nurse or someone, the person who hands out the lollip the, or the stickers and not the lollipops, have them smile at them. That, that might work better. Um, but also to talk to a parent to understand if you smile, not tickle them, not hold them, not give them their favorite object. If you just smile at them, what do they do? And what you want them to do is smile back. Um, so how do you refer? As you guys know now, I mean, I think, I think it's good that now insurers cover autism. I think it's bad that they have to, families have to go through this rigmarole to get treatment. The good thing now is that they only have to go once. They don't have to go back to get reevaluated, but they do have to go and get a medical diagnosis. So the school diagnoses are not enough. And that's another thing. So an early on diagnosis or an IEP, that's not enough. That does not give them access to treatment. They need more than that. They have to go see a provider who can give them the diagnosis and do the autism diagnostic observation schedule. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the autism diagnostic observation schedule because um, it's, uh, it's really limiting and you really need somebody who really understands how to administer it and there's lots of people who do it but don't understand it very well but just so you guys can talk to parents about what to expect, it's essentially a 45 minute play based session. So when I do do them with kids, it's a lot of toys. You know, we, we have bubbles and we have balloons and we have Play-Doh and um, we have snack. And so it's meant to be a lot of fun and it's meant to elicit a lot of the autism symptoms. Um, it is actually, even though it sounds fun, it's a very difficult experience for families. Because the, when we're doing all of the different tasks, it's very clear that we're trying to elicit things from kids. And as parents watch their ch child fail the tasks, it's really heartbreaking for them. It's very hard for them. 
Um, so I'm letting you know that so you understand what it might be like for a parent when they, you're referring to them to this evaluation, but it's going to be hard. If they do get a diagnosis through one of these centers, they're eligible for all these great treatments. They're eligible for more intensive behavioral intervention, mental health treatment, speech therapy, PT and OT, above and beyond what their insurance typically provides. Um, they do have to go through an approved autism evaluation center. I had them upload in the materials that you guys have the most, um, the newest list of the centers. There's 15 of them. I typically recommend that everybody, if, I, if we have somebody that I'm talking to and say, oh, I think this kid might have autism, where, where should they go? I usually say get on every single wait list, all 15. Go to whoever will see you first. Really, where you go does not matter. We just need you to get access to treatment. Um, here's, obviously we do it, Beaumont does it, they do it down in Detroit, CMU does it, Henry Ford does it. So all the major medical systems do it. That's, that's the bottom line. Um, Medicaid also provides services. Medicaid is great because, I always tell my families with Medicaid, you have much easier access to services than the private pay insurers. So if you call your community mental health provider and say, I want an autism evaluation, they have to do an evaluation within 14 days and then within 30 days. Okay, so they don't have to wait. So it doesn't make sense for them to wait on those other 15 uh, places and wait for extended periods of time where if they go through the community mental health system, they'll get much, much quicker access and access to the same services. Um, so you really want them to go through um, the community mental health system, ideally to access services much quicker. Um, in terms of early management and interventions, so I'm gonna say something that I think is a little bit different from what people may have heard in the past. So when I, talk, when I give a diagnosis for the first time, I tell them, these are the big three recommendations that I have for you. These correlate with the four prognostic factors, okay? So you need intensive behavioral intervention that impacts speech and cognition. You need speech, that impacts speech. That's prognostic number four. And then you need management of medical comorbidities, medical and psychiatric. That's prognostic factor three and four. These are at the top. These are your top recommendations. Other things, school-based services, early on services, social skills therapy, OT, PT, all of those come second. Unless there is some um, significant impairment above and beyond. So we usually make that assessment. In, with an individual child. I know I'm um, out of time in one minute, but I'm just gonna touch really briefly on aggression because I think it's important. And that is that um, aggression and self-injury, at least in the kids that we see, is really common. And in, uh, in the scientific literature, we know that that's also true. So there is something specific about autism that confers risk for aggression and self-injury. Um, and I actually just gave a talk. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Autism Alliance of Michigan. They do this really huge parent conference every year. Um, and they asked me to come talk about something. And I said, well, I want to, I know everyone talks about like the kids who go to college and like the kids who do all these great things. I really feel like we need to talk about the hard things. We need to talk about the kids who are aggressive, who are difficult, who self injure, because these kids exist. And a lot of these families are deal with a lot of shame and difficulty, and I feel like we need to talk about it because it occurs in up to 50% of kids with autism. It's really common. Um, and that was a really powerful experience for me because um, you know, there's all these families who are dealing with the same thing and it's really, really um, difficult. So there's something above and beyond intellectual disability or cognitive impairment that, with autism that confers risk for aggression. We assess it with a specific rating scale called the Aberrant Behavior Checklist. The reason I'm mentioning it to you is because it's the checklist that's in all the studies, okay? And I want you to be familiar with what it's looking at. So it's looking at injuring self on purpose, being aggressive, screaming, hurting self, violence, outbursts, moodiness. These are the things that we're looking for change, okay? When I'm thinking about treating um, aggression, my first line is not the FDA-approved Risperidone or Aripiprazole, okay? My first line is behavioral intervention because what we know is that in up to 75% of the cases, the problem behavior is maintained by 
um, behavioral concerns like attention seeking, access to preferred material, or escape from non-preferred activities. So those have to be addressed. And so we address that with behavioral in intervention, speech therapy, and then other therapies like OT or social narratives or things like that. That is our first line intervention. And so that you get, again, through the line of getting an autism evaluation, getting into treatment, starting ABA. Um, if you are not doing that and you're prescribing medicines, in this slide are all the lists of all the medicines that have been shown to have efficacy in treating aggression. The important thing for you to know is that there are other things other than atypical antipsychotics. Okay, immediate release methylphenidate stimulants have been shown to be helpful across more than one study, as has N-acetylcysteine. Okay, so N-acetylcysteine has been shown to be effective for aggression, both with low level aggression and higher level aggression across multiple studies, as well as an adjunct to risperidone. So it's a great agent to think about um, that doesn't have the severity of side effects that you see with atypical antipsychotics. But the piece for you to, this is the big piece. I print out this graph and I show it to parents. And that is, so this, um, the top line is placebo and the bottom line is risperidone, okay? And the y-axis is ab irritability or aggression uh, scale. What you see is they do not come down to zero. Okay, the expectation is not zero. We're not chasing zero, we are not. The expectation is improvement, but not remission. Okay, so as long as parents understand that, then it's much easier to think about. The other thing to understand is dosing. So this is risperidone dosing. Average dosing of 1.8 milligrams, low dose. The same for aripiprazole, low dose aripiprazole. Um, and that's, that's the short and dirty. So screen, refer early, um, send them everywhere, get on every wait list. Um, intensive behavioral intervention is what we recommend first for aggression, for autism, um, as well as speech therapy and management of comorbidities and medications have to be really targeted. All right, thank you. <laughs>